Hi everyone, Dave here. I'll get you to the show in just a minute, but I did want to ask you for a very, very small favor. Uh, the People's Choice Podcast Awards are opening up for nominations on Tuesday this week, October 1st, and we would really appreciate it if you would take a minute to go there and nominate Sound Notion in the Arts and Culture category for the People's Choice Podcast Awards. Uh, we're we're going to be up against some, some big-time podcasts like This American Life and The Moth Radio Hour, but uh, we, we think we do good work, and, and we'd, we'd love to uh, share our, what we do with more people. So if you could please just take uh, a couple minutes of your time this week or next and go to podcastawards.com and nominate us, Sound Notion, in the arts and culture category. We'd really appreciate it. Thanks. Now on to the show. This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Patrick Gulo. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Sam Mercier's. And joining us this week are percussionist Chris Jones and flutist Mirne Shim. Mirne has actually been on the show probably about 5,000 times now. And they just finished a recording last night for a new album that will come out this December. Thanks for being on the show, guys. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you. So literally you've gotten about four hours of sleep. <laughs> Feels like it for me. Yeah. Coming from the East Coast, but yeah. Um, so, I mean... what? We, I don't think we've done a full-fledged AB duo interview here. So, I mean, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the, the whole project and how it got started and what this album will mean for the group. Okay, well, um, I needed a percussionist for my la- one of the pieces I commissioned um, last year or a couple years ago now. Two years, I mean. And um, I, I was going to do it here in San Francisco, but an opportunity came up to premiere it in Chicago. And I don't know any percussionists in Chicago, so a friend um, introduced us together, and we premiered it, ended up recording it, and then said we should keep playing, so we formed the AB Duo. And we've been busy um, the past year and a half um, trying to learn music and book gigs and... Commission. Co- yeah, we commissioned 10 composers. Yeah. Wow. Because, you know... Go big or go home. So, yeah. <laughs> so and it seems like flute and percussion is probably not a medium that there's a ton of rep for already. So, if you're gonna make a go as a flute and percussion duo, it seems like you'd almost have to commission a bunch of new music, right? Or maybe yeah, there's this huge repertoire that I'm ignorant of. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's a, a vast repertoire. There's definitely a few um, pieces. Um, by bigger name composers. Um, but we both felt that we wanted to write, we wanted to play music that um, was written for us. And so this, that's where kind of the genesis of the whole um, commissioning project came from. You know, we liked some of the repertoire, but we really wanted to have something that we called our own. That's cool. I, I, I like that you're doing that. And, and can you tell us some of the composers you're working with? I know I looked at the list and a couple of those names jumped out at me as, as being pretty exciting composers. Go well, for it. Yeah. Uh, okay. So the full list, and not in any particular order, Matthew... <laughs> because you love them all equally. <laughs> well, I guess the two of the most recent ones, the ones that we recorded yesterday, I'll just start with those guys. Uh, Matthew Joseph Payne, Ivan Trevino, um... Ned McGowan, Carolyn O'Brien, Jenna Lyle, Francisco Castillo Trigueros. This is like a quiz. Ken, <laughs> Ken, Ken Wayno. Oh, Ken. Friend of the show. Friend of the show, okay. Um, uh, Drew Baker. Zach Browning. Yes, Andrea LaRose. Very good. <laughs> Success. You get it. You get a 100. Success, 100%. <laughs> no, that's your, awesome. You know, it's a mnemonic device. Trying to get our brains just, you know, up to speed with you guys, so. 
right yes now. we should say that that as they are currently joining us from the west coast and the rest of us live closer to the east coast uh it's while it's it's <laughs> 11 in the morning for me and patrick and 10 in the morning for sam it's eight in the morning for our our, our wonderful guests out in california so uh it's Things things move a little more slowly at eight a.m. and and we're all musicians, for people, so you subtract three hours from the effective morning time day. Right, and and you guys <laughs> have been up working on stuff. Um, so what what has the collaborative process been like for these these new works? Um, it seems like w- there's there's all there would be a challenge. Um, uh, you know, the three of us are composers. It seems like there would be a challenge um, in balancing percussion and flute. Yeah, well, so far, everything we are playing requires, seems to require amplification, at least on my part. So that sort of takes care of that. I, th- I, think, I think that's uh, one of the new music jargon things. Amplify everything, right? Right. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, you, you, if, if you're, if you're uh, watching the show, you might enjoy at new music jargon on Twitter. Uh, but, yeah, amp- amplification is really interesting, and and it's it's cool that you're doing all these works that require it because I I see a lot of performances where people are doing amplification like for the first time on this one piece, and they don't really know how to do it. Sam, if you 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 know what I'm talking about? Well, I just beef about this all the time as a part of like a collegiate music education learning how to use amplification in a not stupid way should be part of the process and i haven't encountered that at any of the three institutions i've attended <laughs> well maybe you can you can bring it to the the institution that you you currently is your employer <laughs> well uh, if i could bring them doing their homework first then i'll move on to that sure <laughs> <laughs> so um so you you seem to have solved that problem uh, what kind of percussion stuff are are you using here, Chris? Obviously, saying percussion is does not narrow <laughs> things down any mu- much more than saying playing instruments. Right there, there's a there's a wide a wide variety that I could have for sure. Um, originally when we started um, speaking with each of our composers, um, I mentioned the idea of touring and limiting the size of the instrument to, you know, manageable things that I could easily tour with and travel, you know, because I live in, in in Rochester, and so Mirinay being in San Francisco, flying, you know, back and forth would require some of my instruments to come with me. Um, and for the most part, we've sort of abandoned that idea, and I've just been like, you know what, I want you to write what you know, you want to write, and we will try and deal with it the best we can. Except when they, you know, when they ask me, I say no marimba. Right. Mm. Why no marimba? Uh, it's, I mean, it's too big. <laughs> okay. And I'm just thinking about all the, like, where am I going to rent a, or borrow a marimba if we have to tour in California? Mm. Um, so it's nothing against the marimba. No, 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 absolutely not. Okay. I, well, I'll put it to you this way. If a composer wanted to write a piece for flute and percussion that included 20 different tie gongs of up to, you know, 35, 40 inches, we'll, we'll, we'll play it somewhere. But we'll probably only play it once because that is such a vast undertaking to, you know, ha- find all that equipment. And especially for a duo, one person, me doing all of the the heavy lifting and sometimes on that end it can be quite the process both financially and logistically what do you mean what is this one person moving hey no 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 you you do great you help me out a ton but i am a professional percussion roadie now (laughs) hey and she has to haul a flute and an ipad (laughs) i like like how marina is a roadie in her own band (laughs) You haven't seen my equipment. That's true. I'm no, sure. I've, and and, and uh, you know some other various electronics and a foot pedal and etc. That, that reminds me. This so uh, I I normally I read I, I subscribe to Mirinay's blog, but I read it in a feed reader usually. I don't usually go to the page, and I went to the page today to 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 look at something, and uh, I, there's this ridiculous photograph. Uh, no, the photograph isn't ridiculous. There's a photograph of Mirne holding 
this ridiculous thing. And I would like to know what <laughs> this thing is. That's uh, my contrabass flute. <clears throat> that is your contrabass flute? Yes. Nice. That is amazing. I've never <laughs> seen such a thing before in my life. Uh oh, we're gonna get to see it in person. Well, if you put, no, if you put, no, 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 no. It's too early. Yeah, it's too early. And but there's this nice little poster that that I made for TSA <laughs> that I put inside my. Uh, <laughs> like, please don't mess up my instrument. Nice. Wow. That's what From a. Uh, from, as a, a highly trained and well experienced uh, woodwind That's technician, awesome. I can tell you that when I look at that, I, I experience great amount of fear. <laughs> Working awesome. on that thing would be a nightmare. <laughs> it is a nightmare. It's like um, it's it's really a cool instrument, but you know, as far as in- <clears throat> the materials that it's made from, it's a step above plumbing. That's for sure. <laughs> So right. what is? It I want to know what it sounds oh. like. Do you have any recordings of it? Um, soon, soon. Um, we're gonna premiere a piece. Actually, a couple pieces. Um, that include contrabass flute on our December first show in Chicago. When did you get that? Hmm, where is this, is this a new addition to your arsenal of flutes? Or yes, it is. Um, I had a, I had a brief. I, I had a day job briefly, and um, that's what it paid for, all my instruments. <laughs> Very nice. I, I, I can't help but notice that it, all of your press shots are with low flutes. Like, none of them are with a regular C flute. You've got, <laughs> you've got your alto flute, and you've got your, now your contrabass flute, and those are the, the, the two main press shots that I see of you. Uh, so, well, do, it's, it's do you not bit... like the high sound of the flute? No, I like it. It's okay. just... Um, it's not the most photogenic instrument. That's and so, true. Okay. Yeah. You can, um, you can do one so, of those shots that were like your arms akimbo and you have, you know, your flute or something on your, like, mm, this is me. I play the flute. Deal with it, people. That sounds like exactly the kind of thing that would get made fun of on one of those blogs that makes fun of shots. <laughs> it's like those, um, like, like, what what is it? Uh, classical classical album covers. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So anyway, now that we've now that we've solved the mystery of this this photograph, I really I really want to hear what it sounds like because it looks like it would sound. Amazing. If you type contrabass flute into YouTube, there's all kinds of videos of people demonstrating yeah. the way they sound. The so, one person that you really really should check out is Ned McGowan. He's the composer that we commissioned, and um, he's going to write a piece for that instrument. Um, and he has one, like um, pretty much the same instrument that I have. <clears throat> he's also an amazing flutist, um, so you should totally, totally check out his music. So we're gonna we're gonna play as our pick of the week at the end of the show a clip of you two performing. Um, this is a pretty recent performance, right? From Friday night. From fr- from so <laughs> from like two days ago as we're recording this, day and a half ago, really. Um, yep. And. It looks like you're in a pretty casual space, uh, and it seems like that's a thing that we. And in fact, I think Miri, the last time you were on, you were playing in a, in in a in a more casual space, and it seems like this is something that is of particular interest to uh, to you guys. Is that is that something that you look for? Absolutely. Uh, so why 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 is why is that the place for for this kind of music as opposed to uh, a more conventional classical music venue? You want to explain about our happy hour format? Sure. Um, so we've come up with a few different uh, program ideas um, depending on the venue. And so what we did Friday was our, our first, um, which what we call our happy hour program. So we highlight. Um, we had three composers, two of which we commissioned. Um, so we would, the idea is to, again, create a happy hour um, sort of vibe where we would play music, um, we would play a piece by a composer, and then we would have uh, a short break from like five to ten minutes for us to set up and for the audience to have a drink, grab a, a quick snack that we have for them, and in addition to playing um, other music by the composer um, over a PA system. <clears throat> it's just like a regular club. Yeah. Like you would, you play your set, and then the DJ will start the music. It, but instead, we have an iPod playing the music of the composers who are performing. 
Cool. And everything's already amplified, so you can have drinks right. and eat snacks and not be afraid that your neighbor's going to give you a dirty look. Yeah, and if you want to, you know, you listen to the piece and then you can <clears throat> talk about the piece. Um, then you come to the next piece, we play it, another break. You can then talk about it and feel free to relax and enjoy the setting, you know, as opposed to a more classical setting where it's, you know, dark, you know, a formal intermission and, you know, we we're really interested in in that, you know, trying getting away from that. Mm. Well, our music's not conventional for this show either. So. Absolutely. Right. right. And it, it seems like you guys, the, what what you're doing is is very reminiscent of, of how a, a rock band would operate. You're originating your own material, um, even though you're commissioning other people to write it. It's new to you. Um, and you're doing these more informal and more casual kinds of performances and you've got the music in between and it's it's all kind of one uh show with the the performances that you're giving of your own stuff and and in fact in the in the video we're going to watch chris you're sitting at a drum set um so i i i want this is a really interesting trend i think to to me of classical chamber music mimicking the way rock bands operate. Is that something you guys do consciously? Well, that's not like our only thing, but we have like two avenues of, you know, music and stuff we've commissioned. One is, you know, more <clears throat> straight up concert music where it may or may not be amplified, but, you know, a lot of times we need amplification just because the nature of our instruments. Um, but we both... Like, the awesome thing about our duo is we both really just, like, rocking out. And <clears throat> just because we're classically trained musicians doesn't mean that, like, that's all we can do. We can, I mean, why do we have to just want to rock out when you can, com you know, commission pieces where you really can rock out? Right. Our, our interests are, uh, in music, are, are vast. And... You know, like me and I, we're both classically trained, and we both enjoy playing, you know, contemporary music. And at the same time, we both have a love for, you know, rock music, popular music. So we've been able to find composers and commission things from both genres. And being, you know, performers, we're interested in both, so we want to present, you know programs that can, you know, have, you know, play one show in a rock club, play one show at a university or, you know, more formal stage and diversifying, you know, and, you know, keeping us interested in you know, one avenue, we're being able to, to sort of hit all of our, our interests. Um, it occurs to me that doing pieces that rock out and are amplified has a very uh, practical application and like you say people are in an environment where they want to be more relaxed and in that context people are used to being able to um, lean over to their partner and say something about what's happening without feeling like a pariah you know and when the music is on the loud side and it's amplified that's a lot easier and that's more akin to the you know the the average uh, concert experience for people um, but that dovetails into my geeky composer questions um, the thing that's interesting to me about percussion is that it simultaneously can be the loudest instrument and the softest instrument you know and people that want to argue against that they're crazy you know I mean percussion can absolutely has the widest dynamic range there is um, so uh, the first question would be, are there any pieces that really harness that power of percussion to play super quiet? Now, this probably wouldn't work in a club, but I'm just curious if anybody really uh, focused on that at all. Yeah. Um, Drew Baker, um, one of the uh, Chicago composer, um, has definitely gone that route where I don't think I'd play above maybe a mezzo. No, piano. except well, for well, the very yeah, yeah. the very end, but he his 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 sound world it's so delicate and fragile 
and but intense. But in but in intense, absolutely. Um, there's there's something like you know, a percussion is a very you know, organic and gestural instrument. Like when I'm playing loud, you physically see me playing loud. When I'm playing small and very, you know, quiet, there's very little motion associated with what I'm trying to do. And even though it might be intense, there's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of intensity to the gesture. So Drew is Drew is a composer that definitely captures that quiet intensity that is um, that can be found in percussion instruments. And it's definitely something I am very interested in because you know, drums are always going to be loud. We can always play loud. We always have that in our back pocket. But finding composers who really can explore the the softer side of the sonic capabilities, it's it's incredible. And yeah. I must say, it's it's actually a huge challenge because my instruments do not have such a wide dynamic range. And I'm not just talking about the louds. It's also the softs. I mean, right. trying to match um, completely <clears throat> unamplified marimba and flute things, it's yeah. crazy how softly he can play. And it just drives me nuts. Yeah, so, young, comp- young composition students, like one of the big things you find is that they write flute music. And if they're writing for flute, they will assume because of its size or whatever that a flute can play so soft and, you know, flute is a little bit limited because of the way the sound is generated. You've got to blow enough air across that hole to make a noise, you know. Um, so the other question I had was about piece length. And this is, has to do with venue, too, and sort of the, you know, the more pop-oriented concert experience. Um, when you're in a club, you know, um, people don't expect to have one piece that goes on for 25 minutes, you know. But that's not unheard of at all in the you know, classical concert or art music experience. Is there a kind of an average length these pieces are turning out to be for the new album? Um, and, and I would think that, you know, a little on the shorter side would probably work better in the, the sort of non-traditional venues. Um, well, well, I think just because the way we commissioned them, they're all turning out to be about 10 minutes. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Cause you know, we don't have millions of dollars. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or hundreds, but so that. Yeah. Go ahead. I think that um, you know, with with uh, each of our um, composers, we kind of went and we thought about you know length and determining you know, and especially for the contract with the commission, that was obviously important. Um, and and even with some of our composers, we we kind of had an idea of the length of work that we would get. Um, based on previous output, but um, at least the two pieces, uh, two of the pieces that we played on Friday were both right around, you know, nine to ten minutes long, Mm -hmm. and the Trevino is split into four movements, so in some ways, you you know, you're getting like two and a half, two minutes, three minutes, you know, which may, yeah, on the shorter side of, of the pop music, but it's definitely something that, because of that length that shorter length of material it's it it almost feels you know in some ways like you're watching a, a traditional you know pop. pop group or rock group or in something in that vein right well i think that even even people who are classically trained and have paid a lot of music for an education are still way more acclimated to pieces that are a little on the shorter side just because the culture that we live in gives us a lot more music that functions that way um, and, you know, Dave and I, I think, are in agreement, and we talk about all the time, that for, you know, eight to ten minutes is what I'm aiming for when I write a piece, you know. I mean, like, in, unless it was a specific situation and the scale needed to be bigger, I, I have no desire to write a piece bigger than that. Well, um, and, and, you know, I think a lot of this harkens back to something that Sam and I were talking about last week on the show. We we, we discussed um, these comments that, that John Adams had made to the New York Times about... Um, kind of the the uh the dumbing down of music as he sees it and he he said uh i just pulled up my notes from last week that we've gone from this period of high modernism to uh quote these just extremely simplistic user-friendly lightweight sort of music light that's my john adams impression i've never heard that speak i'm kidding uh people are winning pulitzer prizes for this stuff now if you read a lot of history, which I do, you see that civilizations produce periods of high culture, and they can fall into periods of absolute mediocrity. Um, and 
so he's, I think, talking about composers that are really that are incorporating and focusing a lot on these kind of rock styles, and he's, you know, he's looking at at so probably some of even the 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 people that that you have commissioned. Um, do you guys? Is that something that you think about uh, the the um, maybe m- about making your your music so accessible that it is less uh, meaningful? Is that a concern, or, or, is, or is that just? Well, the punk rock answer is: Who cares? We don't care. <laughs> <laughs> the other you shouldn't answer, care. The other can- answer that I have is. I want to listen to music that I want to listen to. And if that makes me um, <laughs> dumb, okay, fine. Don't listen to, I mean, John Adams, if you don't like what we play, don't listen to it. I mean, <laughs> and also, I would love a piece by John Adams. And if, <laughs> if you know of anybody that can give me the thousands of dollars Absolutely. that it requires, we would love to commission a flute and percussion concerto from John Adams. Call us up. If you do it for a few hundred dollars in beers, we're there. <laughs> well, and that's and that's the thing, though, is like when I we, and we talked about this last week. When I think of John Adams' music, I'm not thinking of Babbitt and Carter. Like this is not the high modernism that he's. He, I mean, his music is pretty accessible too. Um, and so I, I, he didn't say this, I think, because he sometimes likes to stir things up because he's just that kind of personality. Um, but. I think he would agree that there's a huge middle ground and he exists in it. His music exists in it. So, and, and, and I think that's really what, what you're aiming at as well, right? You know, we never, when we commissioned the composers, we, we came up with a list of people that we were interested in and that we both, you know, Mirna gave me five, I gave her five. Wait, ten. Ten, ten. And then we, we went down from there to what we, you know, both agreed upon. And it was all on the basis of what we, what we listened to and what we knew about them and what we enjoyed. So I don't, I mean, is it, is it dumbing down? No. Some would say, what if they're just taking, you know, they're just having a great idea and they're maximizing everything into the 10 minutes. You know, does there, does that mean that uh, a piece is, is now mediocre because of its length? Not at all. But if the quality is there, then why make it something that goes for forty-five minutes? Right. If the material represent if the material you know allows for that, and you can maintain that high level. Then absolutely go for it. So but this, go ahead. You know, I mean, I mean, as a percussionist, you know, we don't have a ton of solo repertoire, but a lot of our solo repertoire is fifteen minutes and less, and. There's some really great pieces out there, and they're fantastic. But does that make them mediocre? I don't think so. Well, I don't think Adams is necessarily specifically talking about piece length, but uh, the style in general. Um, but I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, but it, what you're talking about reminds me of some interesting questions I had about starting a group. When you're getting together for the first time to figure out what kind of music you want to make as this as a new ensemble, um, how do you sit down and 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 figure out kind of what your your mission is as as a B duo? Is that something that you've ever like sat sat down and discussed, or is that something that you know you started off with the same goals and that's why you got together to make this thing? It's a happy accident, actually, I think, as far as stylistic yeah. things are concerned. You know, we, 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 I think we, we've had this conversation, um, I think, a few different times, and it sort of morphed itself in, into where, where we sit today. And we both come at, like, we are, you know, the, the idea of this group, we are, we are performers, and we enjoy... A wide variety of music and we want to you know sure break down some conventional barriers with one side of our project and at the same time continue our passion for contemporary music and you know more of the art music you know side and 
when we kind of came down to the bottom line, it was a weird performance, and we want to be able to show off our studies and capabilities in a variety of venues, you know, and not in some ways pigeonhole us into one particular style that we're trying to highlight or, you know. But, like, as far as, like, starting a group and knowing, like, what you want to both work on, it, I really think that it's a happy accident mm -hmm. because – I think we, in the beginning, um, just assumed that we would play like the more conventional fluid and percussion repertoire. And then we decided that we want to have our own pieces and we started commissioning people. And then it just worked out like our personalities and the way we want to express ourselves. Um, it just worked out. I mean, I think that's why like chamber music is like dating. You know, um, you have to ha want the same things and be in the similar places in life and whatever. Right now we're in a long distance relationship, you know, but. Um. <laughs> well, so I think some of the things that you mentioned are really interesting to me because so often we talk about these two paths the way that, that Adams was talking about them in, in the Times, where there's the one path of the the kind of lowest common denominator pale imitation of pop music and then the other path is you know writing things that sound like Milton Babbitt and never the two shall meet but there are a lot of people like the two of you and I think like the 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 rest of us on the panel that love that both love a lot of popular music and love a lot of really strange difficult, uh, kind of thorny contemporary music. And it's possible to hold those two ideas at the same time. And it's great that as performers, you are striving to, to perform both of those kinds of music. Um, and, and it seems like, uh, is this, this album that you have coming out, is it going to run the gamut, or is it more focused on one of those two things? It's actually not an album yet. Yeah, it's, it's, oh. it's an EP. It's an EP, and um, it, it's going to highlight just um, the more rock out, rock and roll um, side of it. And, I mean, we plan on, in the future, to do a full-length album of, you know, both genres, but that's a little further down the road for us. And plus, not all 10 composers have finished their compositions. Right, so. there's that too. <laughs> not, not, to na not to call anybody out, but... Well, I mean... Oh, no, come no, on, no. guys. But can't get your act together. <laughs> no, no, we, we, have, we have proposed dates for, you know... Yeah, I mean, the contract's not until... <laughs> they don't have... Their deadlines aren't until next year. Or... We're just kidding. Yeah, right. <laughs> We're just kidding. <laughs> so, uh, should we move on to our, our news topics, or did you guys have any? Well, okay, so our I just wanted to plug our EP. Yeah, plug but, away. Um, our EP is going to be called Things We Dream About, and it includes two 10-minute um, pieces by Ivan Trevino and Matthew Joseph Payne. And this is, um, yeah, it's going to be more pop and rock kind of influence. And... Um, we're, it'll be out December 5th. We're going to have a, a release show in Rochester, New York. Nice. Uh, our, our performance dates are on our website. We'll Check be, us out. Which yeah. is abduo.net, correct? Right. Yes. So, I like how you're going with the .net. It's nice. Yeah. <laughs> People, well, you know, they don't. So. <laughs> .com is so played out. Oh, my God. Tell me about it. Oh. <laughs> I'm sick of it. So, yeah, we'll have links to all those things. We'll have links to AB Duo and all the cool things that you guys are doing uh, in our show notes, soundnotion.tv slash SN. Um, is it, is it, I think it's time to move into our, to our, our news stories. Uh, what, do we, what do we have this week, Sam? Well, first, uh, to get into the story, Patrick should tell us what he thought of uh, Anna Nicole, which he saw in person in New York. 
I, I, it's, it's funny because, you know, I come on this show and then I just like, it's a boozy composer and I'm like, Oh, you know, like, can I, can I truly, do you, can I truly <laughs> give a, a, um, completely objective, I mean, like, there's no such thing as full, as full like disclosure. That. Patrick works at Boozy and Hawks. Full disclosure, and but, the composer in question is on their roster. But to be to be completely honest, I was very, very much entertained. I thought it was a really great production. They went all out on it. I mean, Bam and New York City Opera together. I think it was a it was a good match, and the, certainly the marketing for the whole opera was incredible. Everywhere you go in New York City, whether it's the subway or New York one or something like that. It was being talked about, and there was a huge campaign to get to get the production um, started, and and it was the opening of the next wave festival. Okay, so um, for I, I don't want to get you in trouble, Patrick, but you said you were entertained. Oh this no, is, I, I was entertained, is... and I did like it. Okay. No, I I really I really I really honestly did like it. Okay, um, we don't care if you're biased. That's fine. <laughs> um, no, it's it's funny because you know. Um, Mark Anthony Turnage has this certain voice, and then combine it with Richard Thomas, who was the librettist, who also wrote the book and lyrics for uh, Jerry Springer, the opera. Um, it's like a match <laughs> made in heaven right there. So, um, but yeah, it was, it was incredible. There was some, I mean, you, may, you might not want to bring your seven-year-old kid to see it. Um, there are some choice words, but I don't know. Maybe that'd be better for seeing it. Maybe I take that back. Um, so in the midst of this, in the midst of this very engaging and uh, you know sort of uh, pop cultural and contemporarily engaged and forward looking production that was really well marketed and really well executed and really well composed, City Opera is probably going to file bankruptcy, or as they might want to put it, they're going to reorganize their finances. They're going to file for bankruptcy protection, which is right. not exactly the same thing. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's not looking good. Um, so we we talked about this uh, last week or two weeks ago. City Opera has been in trouble for a few years now. Uh, in, in 2011, they uh, made up some some major changes to, to try to keep their costs down. They um, they left Lincoln Center because the, the the rent was too damn high, if you will. <laughs> um, they, they had Jimmy uh, McMillan out there. <laughs> They uh, they decided to start producing fewer operas. They, they're just doing four operas in, well, on the schedule this season. Everything they've done since that time has been awesome. Like they've been really well. They've gotten like, great reviews. Thinking. I mean, they've they've gotten great reviews for a long time. They're a major opera company. Um, and and they also another kind of mm, change that they made was to change from a uh, salary to a per service orchestra. Yeah. Um, they just don't have the cash flow. Right, they they haven't for a long time because they they took. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of reasons why they don't, but their their endowment is is in the crapper, um, and so anyway, they w- what their plan was was to, to try to raise seven million dollars by the end of this year, or sorry, this month, uh, this which month, is yeah. which is tomorrow, uh, and then raise a, a, a thirteen million dollars by the end of the year, so seven million dollars by tomorrow which is monday as we're recording this and 13 million by the end of the year and their their plan was if they didn't get the 7 million by the end of september they were going to have to cancel the rest of the season and then if they didn't get the 13 million by the end of the year they were going to uh file for for bankruptcy They're, protection uh, and, then cancel and, the rest and basically of, fold yeah. cancel There'd the rest no of next season either cancel the rest of city opera basically um, right. So, so they have now decided that, uh, and we've talked about their Kickstarter project. Their their, their Kickstarter project also ends uh, end of the day tomorrow. So in like a day and a half, they're they've, they've got a little under a quarter million dollars of the million dollars that they were hoping to raise on Kickstarter. So it's not looking like they're gonna they're gonna make it. Um, and they were so gonna now, do the new plan- Castle this year too, which that's a sad loss. I know. Uh, f- that the, they're they're a bunch of cool stuff. That's like one of the coolest things about them is that they do even the even the older operas that they do are often off the beaten track. Like they're they're doing a CPE Bach uh, opera this year, and one source I read said that nobody's quite sure, but it might be the U.S. premiere. <laughs> <laughs> um, awesome. So anyway, a, a cool a cool 
opera company might be going away forever. And the, and the, and the, and the new plan is that if they don't, they're probably going to file for, for bankruptcy protection on Tuesday if they don't make the $7 million by the end of the day tomorrow, which uh, seems like that's going to be a stretch. Yeah. Maybe so. Penny Packer money bags, somebody will just show up in the, Hopefully. the, the 11th hour. Hopefully. You know? Rich Uncle Money Bags, if you watch the show, uh, give some money to us first, but then afterwards you should help out City Opera. Right. Uh, and then after you do that, you should you should give uh, AB Duo a bunch of money to commission uh, John Adams. Right. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm, I'm tying it all together. You, you know right. what? You know what? New York City Opera might survive if they go to a new venue, like a new kind of inflatable concert hall. There you go. <laughs> what? what? I, that's a nice segue. Yeah. Uh, if you. only if only such a thing existed. Mm. Um, turns out such a thing does exist, and it exists. It looks like a, na- it looks like a navel. It exists in uh, Japan. It is uh, a, a project that has been going on for like a year or so now. You, you'll probably remember about two years ago there was a, a horrible earthquake and tsunami in Japan, and um, this this idea was cooked up about a year ago or so uh to give kind of some some cultural relief aid to this part of japan and this collaboration kicked off between uh japanese architect arata izozaki and a, a british indian sculptor anish kapoor uh to create this did i do a, a, could i come anywhere close with those names do you think patrick <laughs> yeah the japanese was pretty good okay I, I didn't figure you'd be the, next, the expert on the Indian name. Um, anyway, they, 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 they designed this inflatable concert hall that could tour this part of Japan. Um, and it's, it's sponsored by the Lucerne Festival in Switzerland. Uh, and so this is, this is the Lucerne, Arc, Lucerne Festival Arc Nova, which is a bit of a mouthful. But it looks really cool. Um, and it's, it's up ish it's 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 in its in its final stages of being constructed for the first time and they're they posted some amazing photographs to their facebook page um so here's here's what it looks like from the outside if you're watching the video uh it goes getting free advertising it does have this weird i know whatever they should give us money (laughs) that's how they're gonna give us a takedown notice because we're using their lizard Right. right that's how the internet works deal with it uh so it looks like this shiny thing from the outside, but then the inside is amazing. Look yeah. at this! Look at these photos of the inside of this thing, and I, I think this. These are obviously taken during the day, and maybe the the like glowing light coming through wouldn't be as interesting at night. But so, yeah, I think the big question is what it sounds like. Yes, right. that's what I was thinking. Well, so what do you think it sounds like? I don't know. I, you know, when you're in a big circular room, you can hear people like whispering from the other side. Um, if you're like in a, if, if, if you have two people across the diameter of a circle or something, have you ever been in a place like that? Yeah. Yeah. And so like, you don't have to talk loud or you could, you could be whispering to somebody and be like 40 feet away and hear them if you're on the exact opposite side. So I wonder if it'd be like really noisy or if like this weird kind of thing that comes up through the middle dampens the sound wave i, I think way more important than that is how reflective is the material that this thing is constructed from it doesn't seem like it could possibly be that reflective it's like no. this light through i don't know what do you, what do you guys think any, any ab duo thoughts on the on the matter how does it stay inflated is it like air like yeah I, noisy? that's what i want to know that's another there, concern that i would have is if there's some kind of air fan <laughs> pump thing how much noise is that thing making it's possible i guess that if they move the fan thing far enough away and have yeah. it like carried yeah. over a tube, like that would work, right? Oh. No. I mean, if you look at the the big the the top picture in the story, it, like the thing that's attached to it is like there are some serious looking tubes running into that thing, and like it looks like the thing that it, it looks like something that would be hooked to the space shuttle before it takes off, you know? Right. So who knows? Maybe we'll somebody one of our millions of fans will experience this and then write in and let us know how it goes. Right. If, if anybody's in Japan in this in the area, the the first concert uh, scheduled to take place here is going to be October twelfth. So, uh, but if this is a if this is a doable thing, I want to see more of these things in, in existence. 
I want to see more inflatable concert halls, and I want to see them all over. I want to see chamber music. I would style. go to these. Like yes. one that's well, this is a pretty small space. This seats five hundred people. Well, AB Duo needs their own, so you can just load all the percussion now gear, you're talking. And the flute, and a There's trailer, no and your own inflatable. Then all you got to do is like a mall parking lot, and boom, you're ready. Is. We just need an army of roadies. Yep, army of roadies, an 18-wheeler, and yeah. That's it. That's it. I see a Kickstarter. Make it, enough, make it small enough for a gorilla style concert. Like, roll in, put it up, play a there concert, you. get out, you know. There you go. Totally. Totally. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, a lot of today's stories have uh, focused on sort of financial concerns and uh, you know, talking to you guys, like you're, you have very practical concerns about commissioning and how much that costs, and you know, New York City Opera is struggling, and these are some of the issues that have been central to classical or art music a lot, and we've discussed these a lot on the show since its inception. And in uh, fact, the first time Miranay was on the show, we were talking to her about uh, her Kickstarter-funded commission of uh, Daniel Felsenfeld. Right. Um, so there's a lot of concerns uh, that, are, that are financial and sort of cultural and engagement oriented having to do with the future of classical music. And uh, I don't want to get too far into it as and Dave and I have both complained we're not a Kickstarter advertising company. But there's a really interesting sounding um, uh, Kickstarter project by a couple of filmmakers called What Would Beethoven Do? Now, <laughs> you can think that's sort of a silly title, but um, it's catchy. And, and you know, and you certainly remember what it is. You'll remember it because, you know, of its uh, cultural connection to the "What Would Jesus Do?" bracelets that everybody wears. But uh, if you watch the if you watch the video, um, all I'm going to say about it is you should check it out and watch the video um, and see what you think and consider backing. But you do have to pay fifty bucks, fifty bucks to get a download of the film if you back it. This um, is, you know. There needs to be some kind of like helpful hint document that <laughs> I mean I I mean Kickstarter does this already. They want you to be successful because if you're not successful, they don't make any money. But like there needs to to be some more helpful documentation about how to price your rewards. Fifty dollars for a download of a movie is is not reasonable. What were you going to say, Mirne? I mean, there's like you said, there's already. Um Hints, <laughs> like lots of lists on Kickstarter and every other crowdfunding organization has their own, like, you know, these are the things you should do. Now, I think the problem is, like, as more organ larger organizations and more people from the traditional nonprofit world get into Kickstarter and crowdfunding, they totally miss the point. This yes. is not your NPR, like, pay $200 and get a, you know, a tote bag kind of model. Well, like, and that's I think even an example that Kickstarter gives in their documentation. Like if you're if you're thinking of this like NPR or like like how public broadcasting funds themselves, you're doing it wrong. Like tote bags shouldn't cost two hundred dollars. That's not how this is to make the tote bag. You know. So yeah, I think you're you're absolutely right. So, sorry, I didn't interrupt. But you you were saying. Well, I think people. I mean, people just need to. Read the manual. <laughs> yeah. I'll read. I'll leave out the choice letter there, but read yes. the manual. I yeah, will say like, it. Mirna is 20... referring to an internet meme that you can Google RTFM. <laughs> Sam, <laughs> what is that? Are, yeah. Well, I, as I said, Google you can it. you can Google it. Okay. Um, but this is a this is a, a regular problem, and and you know I was I was. I've been I don't want to call anybody out but I recently backed a crowdfunding project on Indiegogo that I thought was a really interesting project and it's a chamber music project that had multimedia stuff so it like you know hit hit all my buttons and it was a it was a it was a good group and they were doing a really cool project but they wanted a lot of money cuz they're commissioning composers and and filmmakers and you know putting on a a pretty intensive show but they had just done a Kickstarter or a, a, an Indiegogo or an, I don't remember which, which platform it was. They had just done a crowdfunding thing six months ago for an album, and this it's not practical to 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 do to ask your 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 people for money every six months. 
um, you know, the, the, the kickstarting should then lead you to be able to fund it yourself the next time. Um, or, or something like that, or, or maybe you do one every year at most, but I, I think doing things more fr- too, too frequently is a problem with, with people that are like, like Mirna, like you said, coming into crowdfunding from a traditional nonprofit, uh, donation structure is you, you can't apply all of the, the same, uh, rules and the same procedures to Kickstarter and Indiegogo because that's not what it's for and that it doesn't work for those things. Um, and, and I know that's something that we had even talked about before with you. We asked you if you would do it again and you said probably not or if, if, if I do, not for a really long time. Is it, If you consider doing another one? Oh, we actually... I mean, hi, we have a, oh, we have a, we have oh, a thing yeah. coming out. Um, we have an EP coming out, and we talked about crowdfunding and Kickstarter and stuff. And then in the end, we decided that we both personally have Kickstarter and crowdfunding fatigue from uh, our yeah. colleagues yeah. and our friends. And so we were actually going to um, – and we may still do a, a, a non-crowdfunding – crowdfunding, I don't know. <laughs> but, I mean – Cause like, <clears throat> sure, we need money too. It it all seems like white noise. Absolutely. Um, yeah. You know, you you get, you know, Kickstarter is a great idea, and then everyone finds out about it, and then, you know, see, hears about the success, and then it becomes rampant. And for us, you know, we felt that you know if, you know, if we want to do a Kickstarter, and we really felt that this was a a viable way for us to accomplish our goals, then having that great idea and being able to fund it through Kickstarter, then okay, sure. But just to, you know, produce an album, produce, uh, you know, a concert series or, 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 you know, commission a particular composer, we both felt that we should seek other avenues because maybe we should think about really using Kickstarter for something super important to both of us that we know that would maybe be like a once a five to 10 year project kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Or maybe something that doesn't have a grant that we could go after or grants we could go after to fund that project. Right. And while this, this movie, this film they're planning on making seems like certainly that kind of, you know, it's not like a, a, another just toss off project. It's going to be a big, big thing. But as an example for 25 bucks, if it's a film, you think twenty five bucks? Sort of just your generic thought is I should get at least a physical copy of the film for twenty five bucks. You get well, a refrigerator for an independent film. I would be happy with a digital download. But well, sure, but you should get to see. You should get to own the movie in some format for twenty five bones, and you get a refriger- refrigerator magnet, a WWBD refrigerator magnet. So they they seem to be relying on the sort of hipster kitsch of of their title a little too much which i'm gonna try and get them on the show and we're gonna well tell they're them not all gonna this. they're not gonna make it right they have 25 <laughs> hours to go and they're oh, not five hours left i haven't looked they're 25 hours to go as i'm looking at it now and they're they're about halfway ah so it's it's i mean i and, and when i say not gonna make it i mean not gonna make their goal right I, i'm i'm sure that they will find a way to make this movie uh, and if they do, I would like to see it, but I'm not paying 50 bucks. If I have to pay 50 bucks to see it, sorry. Um, not happening. Should we move on? Not, well, we, I want to mention- We've been, like, lambasting these poor filmmakers who are, I'm sure, making a great film. And, and I wanted to talk about it because I think it's a great idea. So we've been lambasting their approach to, to Kickstarter, but I think the film itself looks like it's going to be really cool. And based off the trailer, it looks like they're capable and imaginative filmmakers so uh, even though their kickstarter looks like it's not going to make it i hope they still make the film um i would love to have a bracelet that says wwdd you know what that stands for dave no what would deemer do (laughs) that's right um not to get into it too deeply because the actual standards in question are coming out tomorrow uh rob deemer this week on new music box has a piece about the new national core arts standards um that were uh he's been a part of the composition aspect of the panel uh advising on coming up with these 
Um, the last time they were updated, this is, has to do with uh, secondary education, uh, you know, standards. The last time they were updated was 1994. Um, so it's been a while. Um, it's interesting to me um, because, you know, I'm the guy who always tries to fold everything back towards education on the show. Um, but one interesting point he makes, I mean, I'd like, I think we, we need to try and have Rob on and talk about this more in depth when the standards actually come out. But um, a, a great point he makes in this piece, um, only, he's talking about the arts in general, only in music, um, only in, this is not an exact quote, I'm kind of paraphrasing, only in music um, when students are studying about art is the past evaluated to the almost total exclusion of the present. Um, in other art forms, there's an immediate engagement with what's happening right now, but that's not that way in music, I at least not in education. Um, and uh, part of his interest is figuring out a way to fix that. Um, and he makes the point that education pushes back. One, one, one way of doing that might be to use composition a lot more, but education pushes back on that because it puts a lot of pressure on the educators who probably when they were in college didn't have composition as an aspect of their education, which is sad. Um, and I make the point that also when you focus um, – your educational goals in collegiate education on sort of common practice music, it's so much more easily quantifiable. You, you can so much more easily grade, you know, because there's a lot of consensus and there's, there's a lot right of... There's right and wrong. There's right and wrong. There's parallel involved. fits and not parallel fits. Right. And, and that makes it easy, you know. So um, that makes it a lot easier to, to give grades, and, and it makes it a lot easier for the students to answer the what do I got to do to get an A question, which drives me insane. Um, Sam recently started teaching college students for the first time, <laughs> if you can't tell. He's it's driving, learning all of the frustrations. It's driving me insane. Um but the most interesting question is, so if we change these, this, this curriculum and we have all the, you know, uh, unicorn and rainbow changes we would like to have, um, what effect is it going to have on the new music world? Um, and it's a very speculative question. And to me, I think it could, but it'll take a while for it to set in, you know. When you have people getting to college who've had a music curriculum through grade school that is focused in a much different way, um, I think it's going to naturally affect the way new music is done. Um, but it just depends on whether or not if the changes are put in and then stay in because, you know, changes are often conceptualized and then instituted for political reasons, not for actual change reasons. So they don't, they're not in place long enough for anything to actually happen and then they're changed to suit somebody else's political. Right, and it takes years for some one for a student to go through the whole process right from beginning to end following the standards for i mean there's time to for for them to be implemented for educators to figure out how to do them and then time to actually do like having students in the classroom takes years and years and years to have somebody go through k through 12 and then university or whatever so yeah and and if, if this is a topic that interests you we should say uh, New Music Box had just a, a, a great kind of special event week kind of thing this this past week uh, on education, and they had a nice little hub for that you can go to to get links to all the stories that they did about uh, com composition in education, um, and you should absolutely do that. And we should we should have one of these guys on to to talk about this soon. Yes, absolutely. So uh, it's is, time. It's time. Is it time? For the pick of the week, <laughs> that didn't have any reverb on it. It didn't. It was, no, was, but there was there was a lot of noise, so it counts. Uh, it's all right, Sam. We forgive yeah. you. Our pick of the week this week is from uh, our guest, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, we have a video from a performance that they just gave on Friday night, as we're recording this a day and a half ago. Um, do you guys have anything you want to say to set this up? I don't think you, you mentioned what the, the piece was. I, all I know is that this is from a performance that AB Duo gave oh. a couple of days ago. It's a highlight uh, video of three pieces that we premiered. Um, two are ones that we commissioned um, from Ivan Trevino and another from Matthew Joseph Payne. 
and also a premiere of a version for flute and per, um, percussion by Adam Cuthbert that he rewrote for us. And so it's a little taste of all three, and um, you can hear them in, um, on December 7th at the Brooklyn Conservatory, um, and the EP of Ivan and Matt's music will be out on December 5th. So visit our website. Yeah. Excellent. So here, here it is. This is this is this is they playing playing live just a couple of days ago.
So I don't know how many people were at that show, but I'm not jealous of all of them. Yes. <laughs> because that was that that kicked ass. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you for putting that together for us so quickly. I, I have an, a deep appreciation for the amount of work it takes to put something like that together doing the show every week. Uh, so we really appreciate you guys sharing that with us. Um, I, how, how, how did it go over with the crowd? It was very well received. Absolutely. Um, loved it. And, you know, getting to see a flutist play drum set. Definitely. <laughs> got a, a scale for, for percussion and flute, right, Marinay? <laughs> And, and also uh, the cartridge for, for the drum set, I think, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, that was, that was great. Uh, so is that something that uh, was, was like part of the, the original conception of that piece, was that Marinay would, would put down the flute and, and bang on the drums? Yes. Yep. And, nice. and, and how many pieces ha- have you commissioned that involve Chris playing the flute? No, no, none. I mean, absolutely no, none. We did not request this at <laughs> yeah. all. This um, was this was not on our our side. Uh, this was all you know part of Ivan's concept for the piece. But I mean, I love it. I mean, it is so hard. I never knew that playing drums would be that hard. <sighs> <laughs> it's really hard, um, and I'm not that good at it. So when you, I, it's not going to be a surprise that, you know, when we recorded it yesterday, Chris played all the drum parts. <laughs> it sounds phenomenal because a real percussionist played it. Because, you know, when I play it, it's fun, but come on. Well, the name of the title is. It is fun. It's fun. That movement. That movement. Um, what were you using to get delay, Mirene? Oh, um, Ableton Live. Okay. And it's running through a laptop or? Yeah, laptop. Okay. And did, does the score like specify a feedback amount and a delay time and all that, or is it just kind of generic? No, um, he specified a um, a delay. Mm-hmm. Okay, cool. And most importantly, were those sequin shorts you were wearing? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. Uh, I'm no. working on getting Chris to get matching sequin shorts. Uh, yes, I think I can pull it off as well as Mirene does. Maybe we'll go, I'll go with the sequined tie or something. Like I'll, I can wear like you know a sequined skinny tie or something. You should definitely have some kind of matching thing. A sequined so skinny tie, I think, the group would work nicely. Right, not so much me in sequined shorts. I don't think anyone wants to see that. Well, the other question I had, Chris, Challenge is: do, do you have a uh, you know while you're playing a backbeat oriented thing? Do you have a an end time stick twirl back to the backbeat oh, thing? Absolutely. You've got that in the toolbox. Oh, of course, um, mine's a little bit more subtle. Uh, than, than, than other rock stars that I've tried to emulate. But, uh, yeah, I, it, it, in the second movement of uh, Ivan's piece, there's, there's a, you know, a measure of rest where Mirne has to switch instruments. So, you know, there's some you know, reverb and you know, resonant sounds happening. And so while I'm waiting to play, like right before she picks up her instrument, you might see, you know, if you're watching closely, you might see a... Uh, a stick flip or two before nice. the, the the next part. So is that that's something that I think would would be nice to write in the score for for a, a really rock oriented thing like that where you're playing a really solid backbeat kind of groove. Like you know you should this should this should look like a drummer drummer fl- flipping his sticks and and wearing some ridiculous fingerless gloves or something. Oh, well. <laughs> so you had me on the stick flips, and then you mentioned the fingerless gloves, okay. and now I'm, it. <laughs> you cannot do a stick flip wearing fingerless gloves. It's, it is tricky. Well, you could flip the sticks, but I do a more intricate, you know, around the fingers. Yeah. Stick, which is. Well, are you looking for a stick? Well, right what, now? I th- what I think we're we're getting at here is that it is is something kind of we we touched on this earlier. This kind of convergence of of rock performance practice and chamber music performance practice where the the show the showmanship is a really important part of it like the 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 stick flip and and Mirne's sequin shorts and you know I also really you know we we talked about this I think a little bit last time you were on the show Mirne about your iPad system that you use to to for your sheet music um and I assume that's what you're you're doing with the foot pedal yes. is is turning pages is that right uh-huh. so I, I think that 
having your music on a relatively small thing instead of a giant, you know, Manhasset stand with the with the ex- extender wing things that so many people love, and I know mm-hmm. percussionists love those things; they're great. But it uh, it puts this wall up between you and the audience, and the iPad is delightfully small yes. uh, compared to a music stand. And I I would imagine that you're probably turning pages more than you might. Uh, maybe I don't understand what's going on, but. Uh, that little bit of inconvenience, I think, makes up for, uh, is made up for by the, the level of connection that you might have with the audience because there's not this giant wall of Manhasset music stands between right. you and they. Well, actually, I mean, if you look at Chris's setup closely on the second piece, on Adam's piece, he does have the giant cardboard double Manhasset music stand. <laughs> action. But the way That's he- what you do. That's like what percussionists do. Like every piece of music for a percussionist is like an arts and crafts project with their part. <laughs> they got the glue stick and they got the the the, the black uh, uh, foam board from the arts and crafts store, and it's it's beautiful work of art, but. It's a barrier. Now, I, I will say a lot of times when you see that, they, they have it off to the side, so it's not actually between them and the audience, which is a little bit better, but it's still, like, an awkward thing, no? You, I mean, you try to make it as um, unobtrusive as possible. Um, but, at, you know, at the same time, when you're playing, like, you know, if I, if I had to do that for, you know, Matt's piece, you know, I'd have to have a stand for my... I'd have to have, like, an iPod for my... <laughs> or iPad for my, my vibraphone, an iPad for my drum set, on top of, you know, then having to have yet another foot pedal He's that a, I have yeah. to play. He right. only has two feet. And, and I've already got four different pedals that I have to play for that piece. And then on top of the frequency of having to switch um, that pedal, it, it gets... You can see where, you know, adding yet another pedal starts to, you know, where where am I where are my feet supposed to be, let alone where are my hands supposed to be to play some, you know, right. some notes. Right. 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 Well, no, I'm, and I'm, and I I wouldn't say that that you should adopt a thing. I'm just pointing out that the difference between those two systems. Oh, yeah. And and that's kind of the conceit that we have to make toward the 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 classical chamber music side of of the the performance equation is that we we have to read music or memorize some really intricate things that yeah. would be really hard to memorize. The best is when you see the solo piece and the sax player or the violinist or whatever has like the eight, the <laughs> phalanx of stands and they slowly traverse from one side of the stage to the other. It's like they're a little progress bar. Yeah, <laughs> uh, they're like a human complete. progress bar is how I think of that. You can tell yeah. when they're getting close to the end because there aren't any more stands <laughs> to to the right. Right, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, man, I really want to see this show live now, like bad. You guys should 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 get some some sweet some more sweet videos like this. We, we plan on we, it. We absolutely plan on it. Excellent. Well, I, I think we should probably wrap it up. Uh, thank you so much for for joining us again. Uh, last chance to to plug anything that you that you may have missed the first time, either grouply or individually. Abduo.net, check us out. We're awesome. We would love for you guys to check us out all the time. <laughs> all right. And we perform Musics. a lot. Hopefully. Yeah, we do. And um, we're still, you know, if you want us to come to your town, we'll be happy to. Just send us email. Excellent. So. Yeah. Contact them. We'll have the links on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN. There will also be links to all the stories that we talked about in case you heard something that you would like to, to check out. We'll have links to those awesome photos of the inflatable concert hall. We'll link to these stories about City Opera's demise, uh, you know, basically awesome. obituaries that people have written for City Opera uh, this last week. Um, all kinds of, of, of cool things. We'll have a link to the, uh, the Education Week on New Music Box. It'll be wonderful. So you at home, check it out. It's going to be, it, there's just so many good things and we don't have time to, to, to read them to you on the show. Also, that would be probably against the law. Um, but you should do that anyway. If you'd like to connect with us, if you have any comments on the show, uh, you can do that live, of course. Uh, we have some, some wonderful folks in our chat room today. You can watch this show live. We do it every Sunday at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, soundnotion.tv slash live, and join us in chat there. It would be great to, to hear from you, and you can, you can pass along your thoughts 
uh, we had some some discussion in the in the chat this week about how people would like to uh, start doing their own shows more like what uh, you guys are doing with AB Duo that are a little bit more casual, a little bit more rock oriented. So I, I assume that we'll see a proliferation of those from from the good folks in in chat this week. Um, you can also uh, connect with us on Facebook or Twitter. Uh, or YouTube, you can like us, uh, subscribe to us, follow us. Uh, I don't know what else people do with with those things, um, but we would love to hear from you. You can give us feedback in those places as well. If you'd like to suggest a topic for the show, you can uh, tweet it with hashtag SN Weekly, and we look at that each week when we're putting the show together. Um, as as I will have mentioned, but I have not yet done, you should go to podcastawards.com podcastawards.com and uh, starting on Tuesday this week starting October 1st nominate us in the uh, arts and culture category for a People's Choice Podcast Award Uh, that is my call to action this week I'm not asking you for money instead I am asking for your love do it so you should you should all go do that. You can't do it until October first if you're watching before then. But uh, if you're if you're watching or listening after then, podcastawards.com to do that. Um, and thank you all so much for for being part of the show this week. Uh, Sound Notions introduction includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching or listening, and we will see you back next week. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> the heck was that? I said my reverb is fixed. It wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't. T- t- turns out it was just as broken. Right. I might have turned it up too loud. There you go. Uh, that, that's the one. That's the yeah. one. Save that setting. <laughs>